top WWE executives named in the Vince McMahon lawsuit, a long-time pro wrestling couple part ways. And our review of Monday Night Raw. I'm Ollie Davis, and this is the Wrestle Talk News. Support Wrestle Talk. Recalling an infamous streaker at the 1974 Academy Awards, John Cena presented Sunday's Oscar for Best Costume completely in the nude. With only the winner's envelope covering where the champ is here t-shirt would point to. But in a shocking new revelation, it's come out that Cena and all of Hollywood has lied to us. All that nudity was just a pro wrestling work as photos have come out of Cena awaiting his cue, showing him wearing a flesh colored cloth backstage. He's not really naked. Wait, wait, I can, I can only see flesh colored cloth there. It's, it's just floating. There's no John Cena in this photo. Guys, we're a professional news outlet. When I say we need a picture of John Cena, I need a picture. Flesh colored cloth or not, we all know what was really going on here. It was a humiliation ritual for Cena to prove his commitment to the Illuminati. Adding yet another case study for why you should never do a pro wrestling breakup storyline with your real life partner, AEW stars Miro and CJ Perry, the former Rusev and Lana in WWE, have announced they are splitting up. The couple got married in 2016, where WWE would frequently book them in breakup angles. Most infamously, Lana's on screen romance with Bobby Lashley, which somehow resulted in Liv Morgan also revealing herself as Lana's lover. That was on the New Year's Eve 2019 episode of Raw, which feels like it should have been much longer ago. TMZ have reported the pair have had an on again, off again relationship for a period, but decided to go their separate ways in late 2023. Perry confirmed the news to TMZ. Miro and I have made the difficult decision to separate after many wonderful years together and have decided to move on as friends and hopefully on screen characters somewhere down the road. Miro hasn't wrestled on AEW since World's End in December, and Perry was recently hospitalized due to a nasty infection of her finger. On the 25th of January, former WWE employee Janelle Grant filed a lawsuit against Vince McMahon, John Laurinaitis, and WWE with accusations of sexual abuse and trafficking. McMahon denied the allegations, but resigned from his position at TKO days later. While the lawsuit directly names Grant, McMahon, and Laurinaitis, a number of other parties are given an anonymous titles or descriptions, like the reference to a world-famous athlete and former UFC heavyweight champion who the Wall Street Journal reports is Brock Lesnar. Front Office Sports, courtesy of some fantastic reporting from Tim Marchman, John Pollock and Brandon Thurston, have confirmed the identities of the corporate officers number 1, 2, 3 and 4 who are also referenced in the suit. It's important to note that these corporate officers are not personally accused of sexual misconduct or violence, rather the suit claims that they and others facilitated and covered up exploitation in ways that make WWE liable under federal anti-trafficking law. Front Office Sports confirmed with Janelle Grant's lawyer Ann Callis that corporate officer number one is the current president of WWE, Nick Khan, and number two is chief operating officer Brad Blum. The suit alleges McMahon had informed Blum and Khan about the nature of his and Grant's relationship, where the suit alleges they expressed concern but were ultimately supportive. WWE denies this conversation ever happened. WWE issued the following statement in reply. WWE takes Miss Grant's allegations very seriously and has no tolerance for any physical abuse or unwanted physical contact. Neither Nick Khan nor Brad Blum, prior to the lawsuit being filed on January 25th, 2024, were aware of any allegation by Miss Grant that she was the victim of abuse or unwanted physical contact. Nor does the complaint allege that either had knowledge of such. Additionally, corporate officer number three was revealed to be Vince's daughter Stephanie, who is mentioned ambiguously. The suit alleges she was aware of instances of her father engaging in inappropriate sexual conduct. And corporate officer number four is Brian Nurse, who was head of WWE's legal department. Neither Stephanie or Nurse replied to front office sports request for comment. There's no easy way to transition from that story into a review of Monday Night Raw, so here's a clip from our brand new season of Monday Night War. I think we're all, all grand. Uh, yeah, cool, great, done, confirm. Oh, um, oh, I'm over budget. Um, already. No, it's fine. 
Hello, lads. What's up? I, I would like to push back on this one. I bet okay. that you would. Okay. But uh, unfortunately, the rules are rules. And you went over time. Which is fair. Any right, pushback on that? No, it's fine. <laughs> what was your pushback going to be out of interest? Uh, can you give me a gimme? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's me. It's me. It's DD Pete. Filling in for Luke as he's under the weather. Get well soon, buddy. And it's time for my review of last night's Monday Night Raw, aka the one that Luke wasn't there for. Raw. In about five minutes. Nailed it. The show began with Drew McIntyre coming out to the ring and calling out Seth Rollins for focusing on everything except his challenger for his world title, which brought out Seth himself, who baited Drew to try and claim on him. Drew did it, instead flipping the advice Seth gave him before back to Seth. He played an Uno reverse card on him. Seth in the past has told Drew to stop focusing on distractions around him, stop focusing on the bloodline, and work his way back to the world title. Now Drew wants Seth to stop being distracted by the bloodline and focus on their match together at WrestleMania. But Seth points out Drew's hypocrisy, saying that he doesn't want the bloodline to get involved, but he thinks he'd actually like nothing more. He beat Cody Rhodes and he beat Jey Uso with the bloodline's assistance. He wants them at WrestleMania. Trying to bait Drew once again, he said that the reason he he hasn't paid him much attention in the build to mania is because on his list of threats right now drew's at the bottom which kind of solidifies drew's point of seth not taking him seriously but regardless drew stormed out and that was that it was a solid segment both cut good promos and raised good points i don't think i'm more interested in their title match though becky lynch faced liv morgan next in what was a corker of a match the two brought their a game and kept up a fast pace for the entire duration with liv actually being the one in control for most of the match hitting moves like a springboard code breaker and a sunset flip powerbomb off the apron to the floor are sure to whip the crowd up in a frenzy and it worked liv hit the oblivion but becky rolled out the ring and in a great mirror later on becky hit a manhandle slam but liv Liv rolled out the ring as well. Becky ended up winning clean with another manhandle slam, but this match was very, very fun. Rhea Ripley came out afterwards, stared down Liv Morgan as she walked out, and had a promo with Becky where Becky had the money line of when people believe in me, I'm good, but when people doubt me, I'm great. I'm quite looking forward to this match, you know? Backstage later on, Becky and Liv shook hands, but Nia Jax attacked them, putting Becky through a table. So Becky called her out for a last woman standing match next week. Rhea mentioned in her promo earlier that Becky is putting her body on the line every week and is gonna leave herself vulnerable at WrestleMania, and Becky's proving her right. Maxine Dupree and Ivy Nile faced Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae next, when Maxine Dupree got a quick hot tag and was going to do the worm, but Candice stepped in her way and verbally berated her, asking why she'd try that and that she doesn't belong here. That's why people are booing her. Indy then hit her with a big boot and won, and this was all very weird. Now, I don't think you need to turn everything that's real into a storyline, and this one felt very forced, especially with the commentators putting over how horrible Candice was for saying what she was saying. It was announced that we're getting a tag team six pack ladder match at WrestleMania, a 12 man ladder match, sign me up. Qualifiers will be taking place on Raw and SmackDown and I am very up for this. The ones announced for Raw next week were New Day versus Otis and Akira Tozawa, DIY versus the Creed Brothers and R-Truth and The Miz versus Indu Share. Judgment Day were upset about this backstage, confronting Adam Pearce and Nick Aldis, where Damian Priest set up a match with R-Truth. Michael Cole and invited Cody Rhodes out to the ring where he asked Cody how he can trust Seth after everything they've been through and brought up some pretty good points as to why he shouldn't. Cody says people can change. I mean, hey, he tagged with Jey Uso. Cole used to be sitting in his coal mine and he changed. Thank God. Cody did the Cody classic, an emotional promo about his family, saying the story isn't just about Roman's title anymore. It's about the fans who come out and see Cody every week. It's about his sister, his wife. For the first time at WrestleMania, Michael Cole will be able to say that Cody Rhodes finished the story. Cody is so cheesy and so corny and he's perfect. And I don't know how he does it, but I love Cody and I don't know why I don't hate him yet. What? How does he do it? What's the intangible quality that he possesses? Scientists will be looking into this for years. The Kabuki Warriors successfully defended their women's tag titles against Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark next in a fine match, featuring Dakota Kai distraction on the outside. Backstage, Andrade arrives and says he's willing to talk business with Judgment Day. Rhea says that Dom speaks highly of him and Finn agrees. They're going to talk business soon. I'm intrigued. Damien Priest faced R-Truth next, with DIY coming out to assist Truth. They get attacked by the other members of Judgment Day on the outside, and after Truth comes to their aid, he gets hit by a South of Heaven from Priest for the win. 
a fine match. Judgment Day beat up DIY after the bell. Jay Uso did his admittedly very cool entrance and called out Jimmy Uso for WrestleMania. With their current characters, I feel like Jay should be winning that match in about five minutes. And it was time for the main event, a gauntlet match for the number one contendership for the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania. Throughout the night were promos for every competitor in the match, aside from Sami Zayn. Hmm, I wonder why. Gunther also got a video package and a backstage promo to hype the match, and let me tell you, it worked. I was very into this match from the off, which started with Ricochet versus JD McDonough. It started pretty okay, but became great towards the end with some fantastic spots. But Ricochet put away JD with a shooting star press to end this first section. But because Ricochet had taken a fair beating, it left him vulnerable for a Bronson Reed, who put him away fairly quickly with a tsunami. But then... Out came Sami Zayn, and the match picked up again. Sami just managed to put Bronson away with a sunset flip powerbomb off the middle rope, but after Bronson was eliminated, he hit Sami with a tsunami anyway, leaving the scraps for the next entrant, Shinsuke Nakamura. But Sami fought back, nearly rolling Shinsuke up immediately, before the two had quite the compelling back and forth, with commentary remarking how these two tore the house down at NXT TakeOver Dallas. I love that they can mention that again now. After a brilliant little sequence resulting in a halluva kick from Sami Zayn from out of nowhere, he just managed to pin Shinsuke, which left the final two competitors, Sami Zayn and Chad Gable. And I was pumped. Both of them get fired up and Gable got Sami to his feet, wanting to beat him legitimately. And immediately, Sami lunged at him, Chad ducked under and hit a German suplex. And I don't know what it was, but it made me smile so much. The drama in this match was absolutely insane, with near fall after near fall, captivating psychology, great spot after great spot. Multiple ankle lock slams, blue thunderbomb attempts, an amazing sequence happened where Sammy just managed to limp into a halluva kick, Chad kicked out at 2.9, straight into a crucifix pin, where Sammy kicked out at 2.9, and both times the crowd bought that it was the finish. Chad throws the straps down, gets another ankle lock in after a German suplex, but Sammy manages to counter, rolls up Chad, Chad and gets the three count. Sami Zayn is going to WrestleMania and Chad was absolutely dejected. Gunther came out to stare down Sami and I am so excited for that match. But I feel so bad for Gable. I want more for him. I don't know when and I don't know how, but he needs more. And if you want more evidence of him being the absolute best, check out the promo he did for a WWE.com exclusive. It's incredible, genuine, and heartbreaking. I love Chad Gable. What's miraculous about this match, though, is that normally when the crowd picks a winner in their minds, they automatically reject the other person. But in this one, they were happy with either winner. They were both over and both acceptable as challenges for Gunther. And that's incredible. An amazing end to a very good episode of Raw. This week's Raw is four out of five. Now check out episode one of the Monday Night War. We're back for season four with me, Luke, and newcomer Dan Layton. And week one is a doozy. Click the video.